If you suspect that a child is being abused, please call your local child abuse hotline. You just might save a life. is one of the worst cases of child abuse I've ever heard of in my life. Gabriel Fernandez was eight years old. And from the time he was returned to his mother's custody to the time of his death, hmm, only about seven months. And they could have easily been the worst seven months of his whole entire life. October 2012, Gabriel returned to his mother's custody after years with maternal grandparents. His grandparents alleged DCFS employees were negligent. May 22, 2013, Gabriel was found barely breathing in his mother's Palmdale apartment. He showed signs of having been beaten, restrained, shot with a BB gun in the groin, and other torture. Okay, we're talking hogtied, starved. The list just goes on. Warning. This story is not suitable for sensitive listeners or viewers. But it is a true story however sad it may be. And Gabriel deserves it to be told. So we're going to tell it. So I sat through it, and I heard the evidence. Uh, I was privy to the photographs, coroner's photographs, the extent of the injuries, and what have you. And this almost demands that comment be made uh, about this case. It goes without saying that uh, the conduct was horrendous, inhumane, and nothing short of evil. Uh, the repeated beatings, burning, starving, binding, uh, shooting Gabriel with uh, BBs that were embedded in different parts of his body, knocking his teeth out with a bat, uh, locking him in a dark cabinet while he's bound, and starving this, this poor child. I, I, it is unimaginable the pain that this child probably endured. And uh, from what I heard, Gabriel was a, a, a kind, loving individual who just wanted to be loved. And so, uh, uh, you know, you want to say that the conduct was animalistic, but that would be wrong. Because even animals know how to take care of their young. Some to an extent that they will sacrifice their own lives uh, in caring for their young. Um, I remember saying years ago a report on the news that, that uh, and this at least sent the point home to me about animals, and there was this uh, cat who had given birth to a litter of cats, and the house wherein the kittens were in um, was on fire. And that's why I think it made the news, because the fire department uh, was trying to put the fire out, but each time the mother went in to retrieve uh, a kitten, and she would emerge from the house uh, by the scruff, uh, holding a kitten by the scruff, uh, and and uh, would manage one by one to, to bring him uh, or her to safety. And the last time, uh, the house was lost, and the fire department tried to keep this this cat from going into the house, but it managed to elude them, went into the house, and they thought, well, she's lost. And uh, I never forgot thinking that she, she made it out of the house. She had the cat by the scruff, except that she was singed, burning her face but the, the thing that really struck me was the cat was not blind the intensity of the heat burned her eyes but she never let go of that kitten and so when you want to say first instinct is to say you know what this is animalistic no it's it's beyond animalistic because animals know how to take care of their young you know i can only wish I, I really do that you both in the middle of the night you wake up and you think of the injuries that that you subjected this poor 
young man, this poor seven-year-old, um, and that it tortures you. I rarely say that. I rarely say that. It'll be a different type of torture because you won't be in pain, physical pain. But I'm not capable, I'm not sure that you're capable of doing that. Um, but that's my wish. He was belittled, bullied, and called gay. His teeth were knocked out. All by Aguirre and by little Gabriel's mother, Pearl Fernandez. That's what prosecutor Jonathan Hatami told the jury. And there was so much more. Gabriel was dying. They were killing him. That's intentional murder by torture. Yeah. So we always say, why didn't somebody take this kid? Why didn't, you know, family step in? Well, guess what? The grandparents, they had complete custody, care and control of this baby. And then mama decided she wanted to get, as I understand it, welfare, food stamps. So she came and got him back. Just for those seven to eight short months. grandfather said that he and his wife, the grandmother, had this little boy in their custody for almost eight years. And then mom came, his daughter, and said, I want him back. Okay. Robert Fernandez told the court today that listening to that 911 tape, hearing the voice of his late wife, and knowing that they were talking about his eight-year-old grandson, Gabriel Fernandez, was just too much. Because he had swore that he was going to bring Gabriel back, and he did it. He was talking about the defendant in this case, Isaro Aguirre. Everybody calls him Tony. He's on trial for the torture murder of little eight-year-old Gabriel. Fernandez's daughter, Pearl Fernandez, will be tried separately on the same charges. Fernandez told the court that he and his late wife, who died of complications from diabetes eight months after Gabriel died in May of 2013, had raised Gabriel for nearly eight years. They thought they had complete custody of him. Thought they did. And they beaten, like Gabriel. He said, I don't know. But in testimony that the jury heard both yesterday and on opening statements on Monday, they were told that Gabriel's mother and her boyfriend thought that Gabriel was gay. And that's why they beat him. The prosecution played for the court the recorded interviews of defendant Osario Aguirre, also known as Tony, conducted by sheriff's detectives in the hours after Gabriel was rushed to the hospital. So, exactly what happened? Cold, hard, fat, now. Yeah. You see them? You see them? You see them? You in the recordings, Aguirre describes how Gabriel made him mad, saying the eight-year-old told his mother, Pearl, that she should leave Aguirre. In the recordings, Aguirre states that he lost control, even admitting that he hit Gabriel harder than he has ever hit anyone before. So you pick it back up and you hit him again, okay? How many times did you have to knock him down and pick him up? Aguirre admits at one point losing count. In their cross-examination, the defense played the video recording of Aguirre's interview with detectives. Aguirre describes trying to revive the eight-year-old when he stopped breathing. The prosecution, however, fought back in their redirect. Even based on that last interview, did you believe the defendant was telling the whole truth about everything that he did? No. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Darsha Phillips, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. So, yeah, you heard it right. This big old giant of a man went and confronted this little boy because his mother said that the little boy told him to leave him, told her to leave him, excuse me. And when the little boy, Gabriel, said, no, I didn't say that, that's not true, or something along those lines, he lost it. That's his story.
he lost it. He said on a scale of 1 to 10, he went to 20 and started beating that baby. In the body, in the head, closed hand, open hand. And then mom joined in and helped. And he didn't look sincere when he was talking about doing compressions and calling 911. I, I damn near saw a smirk on his face. Or maybe I just don't care if he's sincere. Because he did this. It's disgusting. And it's happening way too often. And after all you've seen so far, and all that you may have already known about this case, I hate to tell you that, well, there's got to be a defense, right? And this defense tries to paint this man up to be, I don't know, a good guy. Because he used to work with elderly or some shit like that. Excuse me. But all that goes out the window for me when you do dirt like this. When you hurt a child, when you're a pedophile. You know. You get no love and no support from me. However, I'm not a defense attorney. And it is their job. But hopefully his bandwagon wasn't as big as Donald Wales and people saw through the BS. But check out how the defense tried to play it. Well, after dozens of witnesses testified about the abuse that little Gabriel Fernandez endured, now it's the defense's turn. KKL 9's Dave Lopez was in court and he joins us today with the developments. Dave? Well, and of course, a big intriguing question is when your own defense attorney says that you committed the crime, but you didn't intend for that person to be killed, it's always a wonder how they're going to be defending that person. Well, today we found out. It was through a video, a video that was uh, played in the sheriff's department, and for the first time it was played publicly. But first, the background of what they must overcome. She found a BB that was lodged in, in his foot. After a parade of witnesses told the jury about the torture and the bruises and injuries they found on the body of eight-year-old Gabriel Fernandez, after his grandfather wept on the stand, it was the defense's turn to put up their case. The jury saw a video of 37-year-old Isaro Aguirre, the defendant, crying when he was being questioned the night that Gabriel died. Aguirre is on trial for murder with a special circumstance of torture, meaning he could get the death penalty. His girlfriend, Pearl Fernandez, the mother of a little eight-year-old Gabriel, will be tried separately on the same charges, murder and torture. The defense claims that during this interview, Aguirre kept asking detectives, how's Gabriel doing? Can I go see him at the hospital? He kept asking that over and over again. The defense contends that this is important because it shows that Aguirre cared for the little boy. Sure, they claim, he did beat up Gabriel. He did hit him. He did kick him. But he never meant for Gabriel to die. That's what Aguirre's attorney told the jury during opening statements, that Aguirre did commit murder. But he also told the jury that the special circumstance of torture, which could lead to the death penalty, does not apply here because Aguirre did not intend for Gabriel to die. According to sources, right after Aguirre was arrested, he told detectives it was all Miss Fernandez. She was the one that tortured eight-year-old Gabriel, not him. In my honest opinion, mom should have gotten the same thing her boyfriend got. Absolutely 150% death penalty. But I don't make the laws. The mother at the center of one of the most horrific child abuse cases in L.A. County has cut a deal with prosecutors. Eight-year-old Gabriel Fernandez died after he was tortured, starved, and put in a closet. KCAL 9's Dave Lopez is live in downtown L.A. with details on what his mom agreed to. Dave? Well, Juan, it's over. There will not be a trial. A jury will not have to hear what you describe. can only be gruesome testimony of how a mother simply mistreated her eight-year-old son to the point that he died. 
He was tortured, and it was some testimony at the trial of her boyfriend that literally turned your stomach. But that won't happen again because she confessed to it all in court. Is that correct, Defendant Pro Fernandez? Yes. And with that soft yes, 34-year-old Pearl Fernandez, the mother of 8-year-old Gabriel Fernandez, pleaded guilty, guilty to willfully and knowingly killing her son and torturing him. Do you fully understand the plea? Yes. By pleading guilty and not having a trial, Ms. Fernandez will not face the death penalty. Her plea agreement stipulates that she will never file an appeal and she will spend the rest of her life in state prison. No chance at all of parole. I knew in my heart that she was doing what he said she was doing. Jennifer Garcia, Gabriel's second grade teacher, recalling a parent-teacher conversation she had with Pearl Fernandez in the fall of 2013. We're talking about, you know, his reading level or something or, you know, his report card. And she said, because I don't hit my kids. And she said, because I don't hit my kids. I make them do exercises. But the evidence does show, and now Ms. Fernandez admits it, she did hit Gabriel over and over again, so much so that he died from the abuse in May of 2013 at the age of eight. Are you relieved that there will be no trial involving Pearl Fernandez? That's a hard, I don't know if I can answer that question. And after a brief pause, he answered it this way. I'm relieved for the fact that, um, that testifying in front of their mom would have been incredibly traumatic. He was referring to the older brother and sister of Gabriel Fernandez, who testified at the trial of Pearl Fernandez's boyfriend, Isara Aguirre, who was found guilty of the torture murder of Gabriel and who was given the death penalty. Testimony in that trial was brutal, and the older brother and sister would have had to testify a second time, but not now. And you're satisfied that justice has been served here? Yes. Pearl Fernandez looked straight ahead in court today, never looked around, showed no emotion, and didn't shed any tears. Now, I understand the ambivalence when they asked him the question of whether or not, you know, he basically could appreciate the plea deal. Um, I hate plea deals when they get criminals off the hook. However... You really roll the dice when you deal with the jury. And they were going to try to go with um, something about her her IQ being low. And she couldn't tell right from wrong. And, you know, you never know who's going to be on that jury. And um, which one of them would empathize. And you end up with a heifer like this getting off. So sometimes to just nip it in the bud. I mean, they did it right. If you're going to do a plea deal with somebody as guilty as she is, you got to throw the book at them. And they did. Life in prison. Don't even ask us for parole, probation, nothing with a P, right? She can't ever, ever get out. So I guess I have to be happy with that. But I do think it is fair that both of them should have gotten the same sentence, the death penalty. I mean, they did this together, and she was his mother. My God. And they're right. No emotion. No tears. Where have we seen this before? Oh, in the guilty parents. Yeah, she admitted she was guilty, so there's no question there, but notice the similarities. You know I like to point them out. She never showed emotion, even when she read this sorry-ass piece of a, a, a apology letter or something that she wrote to her uh, remaining children and whoever else was listening. Crap. Zero emotion. Where do these people come from? Like, do you just turn into this person? Is it uh, a genetic? Is it... I mean, I, I didn't hear anything about drugs in this case. So, I mean, if it ain't one thing, it's another. How are these people made? Sheesh. I'm sorry to my children, and I want them to know that I love them. And I hope one day they will forgive me. I want to say I'm sorry to my family for what I did. I want to 
absolutely sorry for this, what happened. I wish we were a lot. Every day, I, I wish that I made better choices. I'm sorry to my children, and I want them to know that I love them. And I hope one day they will forgive me. Is she serious right now? I played it twice for you because I want to know, is she freaking serious right now? I'm sorry for this. Uh, what happened? Are you kidding me? God, I don't know where these people come from, but I wish they would all go back. Well, most kids eight years old were playing games, riding bikes, and just being kids. Gabriel Fernandez was struggling to survive and to avoid being beaten and abused. Despite six investigations into abuse allegations involving the mother, the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services left Gabriel in the home of monsters. In May 2013, paramedics arrived at Gabriel's house in Palmdale, California, and the child died shortly after being taken to the hospital. Gabriel's mother allegedly told the paramedics that her son was into self-mutilization and her boyfriend allegedly told authorities that he had beaten Gabriel for lying and being dirty. Both his mother and her boyfriend have been charged with murder. According to autopsy reports, little Gabriel died having suffered a cracked skull and three broken ribs. His skin had bruises, burn marks, and scars. He had BB pellets embedded in his lung and groin. Two of Gabriel's teeth had been knocked out of his mouth. According to the LA Times, despite the fact that Gabriel was barely old enough to read and write, he had reportedly written a suicide note. One person, Gabriel's first grade teacher, Jennifer Garcia, tried to save him, basically had CPS on speed dial. but it didn't do any good. She told them all about the abuse she was aware of. These pictures in the background are horrific. On July 31st, the four Child Protective Services caseworkers assigned to Gabriel Fernandez were fired. DCFS union representative David Green blames funding for the issue. Now, is that not the saddest thing you've ever seen before? And yet, he still loves her, even as he writes this note and deals with all these emotions in his little heart, and his little head. He still loves his mother. How can you betray that kind of love? I 
I'll never understand it. It's just a forever rhetorical question with no answer. <laughs> Funny, right? But you got to ask, how, why? And yes, child services plays a humongous role in this case and many others. But let's just focus right now on Gabriel. Because he's not alone. There are lots of other children going through this, that have gone through this. So as I said in the beginning of this video, please, if you suspect a child is being abused, call your local child abuse hotline. Too many of these stories you will find at some point, somebody, somewhere, saw something. They thought something just didn't look right. Just didn't feel right. The crying all night from next door, it just didn't sound right. But did they say something? Will you say something? I sure hope you will. Rest in peace, young Gabriel. You're in God's hands now. God bless you, baby. Justice for Gabriel Fernandez. Breaking news right now, a judge has just sentenced a Palmdale mother and her boyfriend for the torture and murder of her eight-year-old son. Yeah, and the judge did not hold back in court today, sentencing them both with some pretty severe penalties and calling their actions evil. Cara Finstrom is live in downtown L.A. with more on this breaking story. Cara? Sure, and these are the two people who should have protected Gabriel most. And today, the mother was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and the stepfather was sentenced to death. The judge then went on to say that in all of his years here on the bench, he has never had a case with such a horrific, brutal killing. Uh, the repeated beatings, burning, starving, binding, uh, shooting Gabriel with uh, BBs that were embedded in different parts of his body knocking his teeth out with a bat, uh, locking him in a dark cabinet while he's bound, and starving this, this poor child. I, I, it is unimaginable the pain that this child probably endured. And uh, from what I heard, Gabriel was a, a, a kind, loving individual who just wanted to be loved. You know, I can only wish, I, I really do, that you both, in the middle of the night, you wake up and you think of the injuries that, that you subjected this poor young man and that it tortures you. The judge went on to say he does not believe Pearl Fernandez and 37-year-old Osario Aguirre are even capable of feeling true remorse. Aguirre was found guilty by a jury. They recommended the death penalty. It's rare in California. The last execution here was 11 years ago. Now, during the trial, prosecutors have uh, called Aguirre an evil man who liked torching Gabriel, they said. They thought uh, that he believed he was gay. Now, shortly after Aguirre's conviction, Pearl Fernandez did strike a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. Today, both sat stone-faced. At one point, she spoke. She said she wished she could have saved her son. And then she criticized extended family who've come forward to honor him, saying they didn't know him. Gabriel's first grade teacher also spoke today. She saw signs of abuse, went to authorities trying to get help. Now she says she's wracked with guilt and sadness. For the last five years, Gabriel has been number 28 in my classroom. I don't assign number 28 to another student because I feel that it's only his number now. And it's a way for me to honor him in my classroom. It almost makes it like he's still here. I find comfort in believing he is now at peace.
Today, Gabriel's biological father, who is serving time for robbery and other charges, was brought into the courtroom, says he feels guilty. He said that in the past for not being there for his son. He asked to watch the sentencing in his cell. Gabriel's death sparked outrage across the Southland. It spurred changes within both law enforcement and child protective services. Unprecedented criminal charges were also filed against two former social workers and their supervisors. They are awaiting trial. Back here live, it was a very emotional day for all those who knew and loved Gabriel. And we can tell you, uh, Sandy and Sharon, that there was a large group in the courtroom today with T-shirts on, including that extended family, some cousins. On the front, it said, justice has been served. On the back, it says, we're not done yet. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to that um, have uh, chosen a career path in uh, social services because they say they want to make a difference. How many people have named their children? After Gabriel, uh, my uh, five-year-old son, middle name is Gabriel. And there's momentum for Gabriel's law. It would give an officer on an abuse call a way to quickly check for DCFS history and alert the caseworker. The proposal is pushed by Gabriel's cousin, Emily Carranza, who pins blame on Gabriel's social workers. They have the upper hand, I honestly believe, to remove him and save him. But they didn't. The head of DCFS says County since Gabriel's death, the system the has been really overhauled. Of this, we have added thousands of caseworkers, which have uh, increased the capability of us to be able to work very closely with families. Cagle was not available to answer follow-up questions about two more recent DCFS death cases, also in the Antelope Valley. Anthony Avalos, Noah Quattro. Children are still getting killed. Children are still getting murdered. Uh, children are still getting tortured, uh, and this is after Gabriel. The power for change, Hitami says, is reflected in this growing memorial amid the toys and tender mementos, a call to save children before it is too late. I know that those that have heard or seen his story, at least those people are going to do their part. And that, I mean, I know that children have been saved due to to his story. Miriam Hernandez, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Please look for the link in the description for the petition for Gabriel's Law. We need it. Rest in peace, Gabriel. February 20th, 2021. We still haven't forgotten Gabriel. Today would have been the 16th birthday of Gabriel Fernandez, the little boy who was tortured and killed by his mother and her boyfriend when he was just eight years old. His tragic story touched so many lives, and today people in Palmdale celebrated his life at the tree named after him. Here's Eyewitness News reporter Leanne Souter with more. Happy An emotional memorial for Gabriel Fernandez on what would have been his 16th birthday. We came here to celebrate Gabriel's life. So many people talk about Gabriel's death, but we really came here to celebrate Gabriel's life and just what Gabriel has done for everybody. I could say for me personally, he's made me a better prosecutor, a better father. The vivacious little boy, just eight years old, when he was tortured to death by his mother and her boyfriend, who were both convicted for his murder. I know that his death was not in vain. His death has brought in all of us here together. Gabriel's family, prosecutors, detectives, even the paramedic who responded that fateful day, all gathering at Gabriel's tree outside his Palmdale apartment to remember an innocent life cut short. For us, it was a, a little bit closure to finally meet people that were there that night that were able to try to save Gabriel. It was emotional. It's it's hard, you know, but we thank them and, you know, their job is hard, a hard one to fathom and I, I don't, you know, we can, we can never thank them enough for what they did. Gabriel's case igniting calls around the world for justice, especially within the Department of Children and Family Services, which had received numerous complaints about the ongoing abuse. His family and prosecutor on the case committed to keeping Gabriel's memory alive, a symbol of courage and change. So many people failed Gabriel, so many people, um, and we, 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 we have to make sure that that doesn't happen again. 
there is growing momentum for Gabriel's law, which would allow an officer on an abuse call to quickly check DCFS history and alert the caseworker. A very special super shout out to AV News crew. He went out and got this actual footage on February 20th of this year, 2021, at Gabriel Fernandez's 16th birthday celebration. And we definitely want you to pop over and um, hit the like on this video. This is beautiful. Thank you, AV News crew. First, I'd like to um, recognize Gabriel's family for being here. Also, Anthony's family is here. I believe um, Steve Owen's family may be here also. And Noah's family is also in my heart and prayers. All the families, all the victims, all the family members of victims. I'd also like to recognize the sheriff for being here. We thank him for being here and the mayor of Palmdale also for being here. We thank him for being here. We all stand with Gabriel and all the family members of all the victims. We will not abandon you. We will not leave you behind. This is my community. This is your community. People say that sometimes I get too close to the family members of my victims. So many people choose hate. I choose love. I am the people's prosecutor. I work for you, the people. I fight for you, the people. I will always stand by my victims. I will always stand by the family members of my victims. I work for you, the people. Always remember that. It's hard sometimes coming here. And then I get emotional. Uh, and I try to keep it together. Um, it's hard just thinking. You just look behind and look at Gabriel's apartment and know all of the horrible things that happen. It's hard. It's really, really hard. My son was born in 2012. Gabriel passed away and was killed in 2013. My son is now eight years old when Gabriel died. And when he was murdered, he was eight years old. So I think about watching Gabriel, if I got to know him, see him ride a bicycle, see him learn how to drive a car, just talk to him, get to know him, see him, his first love interest, just talk to him, what he could have been. It's hard thinking about that. It's, it's really difficult. We now have a person in office who is putting Gabriel's name and legacy down. We have a person in office who is not fighting for victims. We have a person in office who is saying that Asara Giri is a victim. Let me tell you about a victim. Gabriel Fernandez had his teeth knocked out. He had 11 fractured ribs. He had nine BBs inside of his body. He was beat from head to toe. He was burned on his body. And he had to sleep in a box for eight months. Not a prison cell, not a bed, no food, a box. So if George Gaston wants to see a victim, he needs to come down here and see what happened to Gabriel Fernandez. Because Gabriel was a victim. No one who tortures or murders a child should ever be called a victim. Ever. To me, Gabriel Fernandez will always be a symbol of courage. I will not 
allow anybody to tarnish Gabriel's name who are murdered and tortured here in Los Angeles County. I won't allow it. I took an oath to you and to everybody, and I'm going to keep that oath until they kick me out. I will continue to fight for Gabriel. I will continue to fight for all the children in this county. I will try to be their voice as much as I can. So many children need us. Parents, adults, they can't fight for themselves. We need to do it. We need to fight for them. Especially during these times when many children can't go to school. We need to fight for them. And so no matter what, I'm gonna keep fighting for the children. And if you think of anything, think of Gabriel. Think of Gabriel. And then use that strength to fight for all the children. Because I will continue to do that. It's hard. It's hard thinking about what happened to Gabriel. And it's so much more difficult when there is the person in office who, is, who has never said one thing about children. The entire time he's been in office, never said one thing about child abuse. I'm going to keep fighting. I believe that Gabriel gives me the strength to be a better person, to be a better father, and to be a better prosecutor. And I believe that individuals who are standing with me, like Detective Elliot Uribe, who was the detective in Gabriel's case, who went up there with my other detectives and got all the evidence and fought as hard as they can for Gabriel, and Susan Velasquez. These are detectives who work in your community who fight for children. And James Cermak, who went up to that apartment and tried to save Gabriel and tried to do everything he could to save him. I stand with them, with the sheriff, with the mayor, and with all of you, because you're all my family. You're all my family, and I will continue to fight for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Very heartful and to the point. I couldn't have said it better myself. I, I can tell you this. Uh, you know, Gabriel Fernandez, Anthony Avalo, Noah Quattro, and Weiser keep adding more names to that list. Let's not do that. It's... And to think that when he was alive, he came across the street time and time again, passed by it, played under it, shaded summer, obviously, and not much in winter, but in the pump. And I want to, I wanna, you know, I've kind of withheld uh, my thoughts on the current occupant of the DA's office. And, but I can say this, I'm seeing what's unfolding. It's not good. The criminal justice system does not exist to serve the needs of the criminal offender. Let me say that. It exists to provide justice for all. To provide justice for victims of crime. Safeguard, Safeguard the community from people who prey upon it. That's what it exists for. It's a system where there's a, a scale. You see that little balance thing. And that's where you have people advocating on behalf of you have people advocating on behalf of the victim. It's designed that way. There's no system of, of justice where we get rid of the scale and all we only advocate for is the offender. That does not work. I'm not going to support that. That's why our independent will be, will be the ones going. All right. Our investigators are the ones that are going to parole hearings. To be there with the family, stand side by side, 
explain the nature of the case to the parole board prior to them considering to grant parole or not to someone who's, who's already been already been a, tried, convicted, and sentenced. And that process, it shouldn't be ours. That should, that doesn't belong to the district attorney to do. But he elected not to do that job, so we're going to step in and do it for him. And shame on him for that. Another point, and this is very, very important. The entire system of our criminal justice system is somehow has not has been reduced to rehabilitation and retribution. No, there's two other categories that our criminal justice system and incarcerating people serves. Deterrence and incapacitation. Those are concepts that our DA can't even fathom. Why we put some bad people in jail for a long, long time because they're going to harm people. And I don't want other people to look at their example and say, well, they got away with this, so I can do it too. No, that's what deterrence is all about. So if I harm one victim, but I say no other consequence if I harm 10 victims, what on earth is that? That is not justice. That's a travesty of justice. We're not going to support that. We're not going to support that. I don't expect anyone to support that. So I'm going to stand side by side. All victims of crime, definitely. The family of Gabriel, of Anthony, of Noah, every other one in between. In all kinds of cases now that are somehow going to be relived and brought back. We have a case now where the defendant was a juvenile at the time. Four years later, we solved the case. Now they're an adult. And now, I guess, yeah, I guess the person just walks with a little post-it on his record, and that's justice. No, that's not. And we're going to have to think of something different. We are supporting reform, but that reform has to be a conversation between the community and Sacramento, the legislature. The ones who make the laws that we're supposed to enforce, that's where the conversation has to be. That's where it's most appropriate. And yes, we're not going to lock away people that have the potential of rehabilitating and become a, a productive member of society by all means. We want to do that. Can we rehabilitate those that are inside our jails right now in our prison? Yes. And we're trying to increase the capacity to rehabilitate people. But that does not mean that I'm going to give people a pass for using a gun in a crime. Be a member of a violent street gang and using that to further their gang. No. Same thing with multiple victims. Same to all the different special circumstances. No, that is not justice at all. That's a travesty of justice. So let's have a conversation in Sacramento, by all means, and the DA can jump in that conversation. But uh, I'm going to say, no. Aquí no más. So, with that, thank you all for coming here today for this special moment. And again, on behalf of the entire Sheriff's Department, my condolences to Gabriel's family, to Anthony's family, Noah's family, the Owens family, I know you're here, and for everyone who's ever suffered uh, and been a victim of violent crime, we're here to stand with you. Thank you.